So today we're continuing on with the study of 2 Corinthians, which I've been doing for the past few months now. So we're up to chapter 7. So let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. As usual, I will do a brief review of what we covered last month before we get into this. Now, we recall at the start of this series of, um, of lessons on 2 Corinthians, they are provided sort of a general over, uh, overview structure of, of the book as a whole. Alan's just mentioned uh, in the Lord's Supper talk that chapters 8 and 9 are sort of really focused on the matter of giving. Uh, so we'll be getting to that, Lord willing, uh, next, next month, those two chapters. But chapters 1 through to 7 are about the reconciliation that Paul is trying to achieve with the Corinthians. And this is, of course, the last chapter now that we're about to look at in this uh, particular, I would say subject, because it's too loose to call a subject, but general uh, sort of theme or structure that Paul is, is writing about in these first seven chapters of this letter, his reconciliation with the Corinthians after having such a uh, fragile and, and uh, difficult, tumultuous time with, with the Corinthians in his relationship with them. So... Looking then at, uh, at chapter 6, um, we've, we've, we, I've also pointed out that you know, he does oscillate between a personal matter and then a doctrinal matter. He sort of throws in both. Uh, it's obviously a very personal letter. And we'll see in chapter 7 that it's, this is probably the most personal part of the entire letter. Chapter 7 is, is one of the most personal parts. But he's still managing to, to give teachings and instructions to the Corinthians. <coughs> You know, so for example, in, uh, in chapter 6, verse uh, 3 and 4, he, he, he talks about his personal relationship with them, saying that he's given no cause for offence in anything, uh, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God in endurance and afflictions and distress and so on. So he's still uh, trying to show them that in all that he does with the Corinthians, he has is, he is never sought to... Um, deceive them or to, to use them in any way. He's always been there for th been doing these things for their benefit. Uh, we could skip down a bit further to verse 11 of chapter 6, saying um, our mouth has spoken freely to you O Corinthians, our heart is opened wide. So he's, there's a lot of emotion in this letter that Paul is really, he just wants to be on good terms with them again. After everything they've gone through he wants to put it behind them now and move on uh, with a, uh, a better relationship with these people. Um, but, of course, as I mentioned, he also manages to throw in some teachings. Uh, in verse uh, six, uh, verses uh, four, 14 and 15, he's talking about idolatry and things like that. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Uh, verse 15, what harmony has Christ with Belial? Verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And then, he, so he's, he's throwing this teaching in. And recall, you know, it was a long time ago I did a, a lesson on uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9 and 10 where he deals with uh, the problem of idolatry with the Corinthians, right? That they were saying, you know, uh, who cares? It's just an idol. It's just a lump of wood. There's no meaning behind it. And Paul, of course, says, yes, you're sort of right, but at the same time, don't get involved in it. Um, he's bringing it up again here at the end of chapter 6. He, he reminds them again not to get involved with idols. So perhaps it's still a problem. They have his first letter. If they really want to see the, the, the meat of the subject, they can go look at his first letter, but he's reminding them here that about idolatry. And then he follows it up with the promise. The promise. Why do we stay away from idolatry? Because of the promise. In verse, uh, in, uh, verse 16 and 17 and 18, I will, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That chapter 7, verse 1 verse really belongs at the end of chapter 6. Absolutely terrible chapter division place there, but uh, it really belongs at the end of chapter 6. Um, Therefore, having these promises that God will walk among us, that he will be a father to us and we will be sons and daughters to him, keep away from idolatry, keep ourselves pure, keep, our, keep ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's Paul's chapter 6. 
that he's, he's always seeking their benefit to teach them to not to see he's not ever sought to deceive them or discredit the ministry he's always put them first <laughs> now I've gotten ahead of my notes here um, chapter 7 as I mentioned before this is probably the most personal uh, part of the whole letter right in the middle here we're, we're halfway through the letter more or less and chapter 7 coming to the end of this sort of reconciliation the whole chapter is essentially one of personal matters except for except for verse 1 and um, sort of it's hard to, to, to split this out into any obvious subjects so I'm going to deal with this whole chapter as one as one text and we'll see if we can tease out some ideas and some subjects from this chapter but it's you can't sort of break it into two or three sections and say this is that and that's that I don't really think you can do that with this particular part of the letter so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from verse 2 through to the end um, and we'll, we'll see what we can pick out from this chapter two things that I thought we could sort of tease out from the subject is is Paul's personal um, you know his anxiety over the Corinthians during his travels and then his joy at their repentance because remember some of them had repented and we can ask ourselves as we read this how did he find out that they had repented you know why was he so anxious over them uh, why was he so joyous when he found out they had repented so let's read from verse 2 and let's think about some of these subjects or themes that we can find in the chapter as we go through it <coughs> so verse 2 uh, make room for us in your hearts we wrong no one we corrupted no one we took advantage of no one I do not speak to condemn you for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together great is my confidence in you great is my boasting on your behalf I am filled with comfort I am overflowing with with our uh, with joy in all our affliction for even when we came into Macedonia our flesh had no rest but we are, were afflicted on every side conflicts without fears within but God who comforts the depressed comfort us by the comfort by the coming of Titus and not only by his coming but also by the comfort which with which he was comforted in you as he reported to us your longing your mourning your zeal for me so that I rejoiced even more <coughs> For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that, your, uh, that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. <coughs> For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. For although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be known, uh, might be made known to you in the sight of God. For this reason we have been comforted. And besides our comfort, we, jo we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refre refreshed by you all. For if anything I have boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame. But we all spoke all... Uh, but we spoke all things to you in the truth, so that our boasting before Titus proved to be in the truth. For his affection abounds all the more towards you, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that in everything I have great confidence in you. So as I mentioned, this is uh, the, the core cornerstone of Paul's personal relationship in this letter with the Corinthians now think about in the past few months all the times that Paul in the previous chapters that Paul has brought up the matter of his spirit uh, his uh, physical sufferings his persecutions it's come up several times hasn't it in this letter the fact that he's undergone a lot of physical sufferings uh, for the Corinthians and the problem that that created with some of them in that they regarded that as something to be ashamed of and Paul is making it very clear no suffering for the sake of Christ is something to glory and to be proud of now in this particular chapter this this personal section here think about how many times he has actually brought up the matter of physical persecution 
And really, it only crops up once in the whole chapter, and that's in verse 5. For when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. So that's talking about physical persecution. His flesh uh, had physical persecution, uh, fears within, could be referring to Titus, but in the context, probably more, more so relating to concern about his immediate well-being. You know, he's, he's being chased or persecuted. Who knows what's happening? And he's, he's got fears within about what's going to happen next, where he's going to spend the night, what's going to happen tomorrow, that kind of thing. Um, but think about it. In the whole chapter, he only gives us one, one reference to his actual physical sufferings. But the rest of the chapter is full of anxiety and joy, but not over the matter of physical persecution, but rather over the matter of his relationship with the Corinthians. The whole chapter is about, yes, he was full of anxiety and full of fear, and then full of joy and happiness, but none of it was to do with his physical state. It was all to do with his relationship with the Corinthians, because that was really the only thing he cared about. Um, you know, he sent Titus to them, he doesn't know what they're going to do, how they're going to treat Titus, if they're going to reject him or accept him. He's asked them to repent over the, uh, in, in his first letter to them, all the, all the issues he went through. Are they, are they going to repent? He's had that sorrowful visit that he referred to in chapter 2. Are they going to repent of the things that were said then? He doesn't know how they're going to respond. And that's why he's so full of anxiety. His physical sufferings are of no uh, importance uh, for Paul uh, in comparison to uh, the anxiety that he feels um, over how the Corinthians are going to respond to, his, uh, to his, his message, that they need to repent. Now, Titus, of course, as, as we read here, uh, he does come. He says in verse 6, But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And that was... Uh, huge change for Paul, a huge comfort, uh, filling him, turning him from being utterly depressed and anxious into a position of joy and comfort. Now, Titus, let's, you know, we looked at Paul's itinerary at the start of this series and how Titus fitted into that picture. I think we should probably have a quick review of, of Titus and how he fits into the the subject matter here. Why is Paul talking about Titus? And I did, I did have a printout of a map of Asia Minor and, and Europe, but it didn't work out. So unfortunately, we're going to have to picture uh, Paul's missionary journey in our heads, or perhaps turn to the backs of our Bibles if you've got a map in the back of it. Um, let's let's go back to the start and do some revision. So. In Acts, and, and keep your finger obviously in, in 2 Corinthians uh, here, but let's, uh, let's turn to Acts 19 and probably put a finger in that chapter too because we'll be flicking back and forth between them. I'll put a bookmark in there. Um, so Acts 19, we recall that Paul's so-called third missionary journey, Paul is in the city of Ephesus. Um, it says, uh, Acts 19 verse 1, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples there. So, uh, and then skipping down to verse 9 and 10, he eventually withdrew from the city to a school. I mean, he's still in the region of Ephesus, but there's a school there called the School of Tyrannus. And it says in verse 10, this took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul's in Ephesus for two years. Um, and during this time, he had intended to visit the Corinthians as part of a, a long journey back to Jerusalem. He had, he had planned to go to Jerusalem. Um, that's actually referenced somewhere in Acts. Uh, uh, I didn't write it down, but I do have it somewhere. Um. Oh, there it is. Sorry, Acts 19, verse 21. Uh, he's in Ephesus, and it says that Paul purposed in his spirit to go to Jerusalem after he'd passed through Macedonia and Achaia. So if we 
Um, uh, this is why I wish we had the map. So um, Macedonia is the re region to the north of well, what we call Greece today is basic, more or less, is, is equivalent to Achaia. It's that southern part where Athens is and Corinth and um, those, those cities to the south there. That's the region of Achaia and then north of that is Macedonia. Um, so Paul's planned, he's in Ephesus, which is in what is today known as Turkey, on the western coast, Asia Minor. He's planning to go and visit Achaia and, and Macedonia on his way back to Jerusalem. So that's his plan. Uh, but as we know, if we turn to uh, 2, 2 Corinthians uh, verse 1, uh, so chapter 1, he didn't exactly get to follow the plan he had intended. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15 uh, it says, in this confidence, I, I Paul, had intended to uh, first come to you in Corinth, which is in Achaia, so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and uh, to be helped on my way, uh, on my journey to Ju Judea. So his plan to head across to the west to Achaia, which is where Corinth is, head north up to Macedonia, come back again through Gr Corinth and then off to Jerusalem. That was his plan, but as we know, that didn't happen. And that's, that was one of the criticisms he received from the Corinthians, from some of the Corinthians, that, oh, what are you doing? You, had, you, you thought you were coming, you didn't come as planned, um, and they're uh, 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 condemning him for that. Uh, but so, in Acts chapter 20, uh, flipping back to Acts chapter 20 now so he's, in, he's been in Ephesus he's had his plans as we know there was the uproar with Demetrius the silversmith there was a riot in the city uh, as some of the pagans there uh, had had enough of Christianity just spreading and, and taking over all their business they were losing their business in the, in the field of idolatry or the, the silversmiths couldn't make idols anymore so there was a riot in the city a huge uproar and Paul had to flee the city and it says in Acts chapter 20 verse 1, after the uproar had ceased, Paul, uh, had ceased, Paul sent for the uh, disciples. And when he had exhorted them and taking his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. So he goes straight north. He doesn't go through Achaia as planned. He goes straight to Macedonia after leaving Ephesus. That's where the criticism comes in from the Corinthians. Um, now one thing that we don't see, however, in Acts is the fact that he stopped along the way in the city of Troas. He just says he goes straight to Macedonia. Of course, he has to go across an ocean or a sea, the Aegean Sea, to get across. He's on one landmass in Asia. He has to get across the ocean to get to Europe, to Macedonia. He goes to the port city of Troas um, in order to get to Macedonia. And so if we turn to 2 Corinthians 2, we can see that. Uh, verse 12, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, it says, Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, a door was opened for me in the Lord. So he's, he's still in the, uh, Troas is still on the Asian side of the, of the sea. So he hasn't, he's still sort of, uh, hasn't gone across yet into Macedonia. He's in the city there. And it says a, a gospel, uh, sorry, a door was opened for the gospel. So he establishes a congregation there, or he finds disciples there. Um, but it says in verse 13, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking, of, taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. So this is what we read about with the anxiety uh, that, that we're reading about in, in chapter 7. The anxiety he was filled with was because he had planned to meet up with Titus in the city here, the city of Troas. But he wasn't there. He had no rest in his spirit, not fighting Titus. And so he, he, he crosses the sea and goes into the land of Macedonia. Um, now, another thing Acts doesn't tell us about is... Uh, why, why was Paul intending to catch up with Titus in the city of Troas? What was Titus doing in Corinth? doesn't tell us in Acts. Um, we have to turn across to chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 18. 
is one of the verses that tells us about it. But uh, he's talking about the fact that Titus had gone to Corinth and now he's come back and caught up with Paul. Now Paul's writing this letter and it says in verse 18, I urged Titus to go and I sent the brother with him. So Paul has urged uh, Titus to go to the city of Corinth. Now, when, when did this urging take place? Uh, it's not 100% clear, but I think we have a pretty good guess if we turn to Acts chapter 20, as we read before. Uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 1, we read this already, but it says, After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and then he left to Macedonia. I, it's probably a good guess that at that point in time, after the uproar has ceased, Paul has decided it's time to go. He's going to Troas and then Macedonia. He sends for the disciples. I think at that time is when he sent Titus across to Corinth at the same time. So they part their ways. They both leave the city. Titus off to Corinth to check up on how things are going. And Paul goes up to, to Troas. That's my theory anyway, putting together all these passages. Perhaps someone's picked up something I've missed, some other itinerary. But that's, that's how I can piece it together as best as I can. Um, and so the plan, of course, being that they meet up in Troas. Titus, having caught up with the Corinthians, seen how they're going, uh, he would come and meet, them, uh, meet Paul in Troas and give him an update. It didn't happen. Uh, that's why he was so uh, filled with distress. So that brings us back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 now. Uh, as we read already uh, in verse 5, it says, We came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So all, after all that had happened, eventually they do meet up, not in Troas as planned, but further north, across the sea, in, in the region of Macedonia. Uh, so, what news did Titus bring Paul? What was the, 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 uh, the content of that news? Uh, and what was the exact problem as well that we, we can see here that Paul was really concerned about? But maybe what was the, um, the linchpin of, of his conflicts with the Corinthians? And I am... I, I, the way I interpret it is, is, is in chapter 7, verse 12, we perhaps see a hint of what the real key problem was, and that is when Paul says to the Corinthians, So all that I wrote to you is not for the sake of the offender, but for the sake of the one offended. And we read the words offender and offended. We can think about all the things that Paul writes about in his first letter to the Corinthians. He writes about, you know, some of them saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I am of Apollo doesn't really fit. He talks about adultery, he talks about all sorts of things, about marriage and, and uh, things like that. But of course we know in 1 Corinthians 5, he talks about the man who has his father's wife. And I think, and of course he deals with that in the previous, uh, I think in chapter 3 he deals with the same subject. So it's a pretty good guess that when he talks about the, um, the offender and the one offended, He's talking about the man who had his father's wife, and that was probably one of the key problems that he faced with the Corinthians. And so, knowing that that's the uh, the content of the issue that they're facing, um, if that if that's indeed the case, but let's let's assume for the sake it is, um, this has of course affected the entire congregation, hasn't it? Because not only was it just the sin between those two two people. The whole congregation had come to accept it. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, You have not boasted, or, sorry, you, you have not repented, you have boasted. They had boasted about the fact that this sin had existed among them, and they were so tolerant. They were liberal, they were tolerant. We, we, we accept everybody, even this man who had his father's wife. Uh, that, was, that seems to be the problem they were facing, that they were so tolerant of this sin. Paul's saying, no, you shouldn't be boasting about this, you should be sorrowing about it. So it had affected all of them. Um, and so going back now to uh, verse 8 of, of chapter 7. Uh, Titus has brought a report, a good report, that the Corinthians have by and large repented. And Paul says... For although I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. For though I, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, but only for a little while. 
I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. So Paul, we can extract a teaching here about the different types of sorrow that exist in the world, can't we? Paul is telling us that there is a sorrow of this world and that there is a sorrow of God. And one of them leads to death and one of them leads to salvation. Now, there are many examples we could pick and I think the two most... The thing I have talked about this before and the example I usually give, and probably most people give, are the, are the examples of Judas Iscariot as being the example of sorrow leading to death and the example of the, the Jews in uh, Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost as an example of uh, sorrow leading to repentance. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 27 verse 3 for the first example. Judas Iscariot has betrayed Jesus. He has been crucified. But it says, Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver. So, he, and it says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So Ju Ju Judas, he felt remorse. He felt sad about it. But we, we know what he does. He goes and kills himself. Um, yeah, in verse 5, he threw the pieces of silver into the temple and he went away and hanged himself. So Judas's sorrow did not lead to repentance. It led to uh, not just physical death, but spiritual death also. And the counterexample is in Acts chapter 2. Paul, on the day of Pentecost, is preaching to all the Jews in Jerusalem from all the different cities and nations of the world. And he's told them, You've just killed your Messiah. You just murdered this, this, the Messiah as, <laughs> as promised, um, as prophesied about, you, you've killed him. And at, at least some of them were repentant. In verse 37, it says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Did they go and kill themselves? Because they were pierced to the heart? No. They said, brethren, what shall we do? That's the correct response. When you realize you've sinned, um, as these Jews did, you don't sorrow according to the world, which is what self pity, or you know, I, I, Judas was would have been filled with self pity. Um, you know, you, you acknowledge it before God, you repent, and you change your ways, and you say, What shall we do? You look to the Bible, you look to the Word of God, and Peter goes and tells them what to do, and they go and do it. So their repentance led to salvation. So, skipping, uh, turning back now to 2 Corinthians. Um, this repentance that they have, have um, done, they've done, they've repented, um, Paul, Paul says, well, this, that's great. Like, this is, um, you don't need to do any more. This is, you've done exactly the right thing. In verse, uh, in verse uh, 11, he, he praises them for the, the godly sorrow that they had had had, had, had. Uh, in verse 11. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So... And then, he, and then he says, um, so that, though I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, but for the one offended. So, you know, that's, that's the subject here, that fate, dealing with this problem in the church. In everything, they demonstrated themselves to be innocent in the matter. Now, you might recall uh, in chapter, back in chapter 3, Paul does point out that they've probably gone too far. They've, they've, they've disfellowshipped this guy as he told them to do. He's repented and he, they haven't let him back in yet. So he's telling them, you still need to bring him back into church and show that you love him. But, but as far as the fact that they had acknowledged, yes, they had sinned in what they, in their, what they had initially done in tolerating this sin in their church, uh, well, Paul says, in everything, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent of the matter. These words that Paul chooses here 
let's let's briefly pause on on what these words mean indignation fear longing zeal and av avenging of wrong indignation what what was there to be indignant about they realized that hang on we we have been putting up with sin we've actually been wel welcoming sin into our lives into our congregation they had become indignant about it and not in an in unrighteous sort of uh, or self-righteous sort of way rather they responded in the way they should have responded which is to disfellowship this man but let him back in again eventually once he repented uh, what fear fear of what I presume fear of God understanding that that God must be obeyed that God is a loving God but he's also a God of wrath and vengeance longing and zeal this acknowledgement of, of a fervent desire to serve God that we don't just do it by halves we, we, we put our all our heart and soul and body into serving God avenging of wrong not not avenging for the sake of punishing the man because it's it feels good to rub somebody else's face in the dirt but rather the avenging of wrong comes from the desire to bring about repentance that can lead to salvation now Paul had more than one reason to be uh, anxious as we read about in the next section of the passage here uh, yes he was anxious about his relationship with the Corinthians but he was also anxious for his own um, his own uh, what's the word trustworthiness I suppose uh, he has told Titus all these great things about the Corinthians and mind you that's just that's not with the fact that he's had to write his first letters to them and he's had a really bad meeting with them he's still given Titus a really good report that they're ultimately they're good people and they're good Christians um, but he was actually really worried while he was off traveling to Troas and to Macedonia about how Titus would be received and whether that would cast a bad lie on his own name because if Titus was rejected then Titus is going to say well Paul you told me that they were a good bunch but they actually haven't listened to anything you said and in fact they didn't even accept me that was another source of concern for Paul as you read about in uh, verse 13 um, for this reason we've been comforted and besides our comfort we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all for if in anything I have boasted to him about you I was not put to shame but as we spoke all things to you in truth so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth so there we have it that Paul has boasted about the Corinthians to Titus and he just he was a bit worried about it he was a bit worried that the things wouldn't go as he hoped when he sent Titus to the Corinthians but of course as we know for the most part the Corinthians did repent and they accepted him as it says in verse 13 they accepted him with fear and trembling they acknowledged that Titus was actually um, sent by the Apostle Paul and that he needs to be listened to as someone having some authority so Paul was comforted in many ways with the coming of Titus that his relationship with the Corinthians was on the mend and that what he had said to Titus about the Corinthians was you know uh, backed up in the end by their actions and so I think from this little passage we can see the importance of reputation even among the brethren it's not um, a, a purely worldly idea about reputation and having a good rapport but here in fact we see the reputation between these three parties Paul and Titus and the Corinthians are all are all relying on on a sort of word of mouth reputation they've all got ideas about each other the Corinthians have got some pretty bad ideas about Paul because of the super apostles which we'll get to later on they've been told all these sorts of horrendous horrible things about Paul and here's actually some of them have got a really bad idea about Paul because of this word of mouth um, everything that Titus knew about the Corinthians oh well, as far as we can see he's never met them before everything he knows about them comes from what Paul has told him and so anything that eventuates out of that it's going to reflect either well or poorly on Paul and so I guess in the same way you know we're here today 
we all know other congregations and other preachers and other brethren with the, the all the brethren in Papua New Guinea that we know about we haven't met them but we know about them from the report of other trustworthy brethren just as we see here so if you're as a scriptural example at least of relying on the testimony of other brethren to know about what other congregations are doing in the world so that's that's the chapter as we see highly um, concerned with the personal matters of Paul with the Corinthians and and how Titus fits into that very personal letter uh, we can get some really good insight into Paul as a person from the letter that his zeal for God is so strong that it it uh, everything else powers into significance uh, his physical sufferings are just not relevant when compared against his concern for the spiritual well-being of the Corinthian brethren we see that the self-pity of Judas the self-pity of the world when filled with sorrow leads to death and that's the example we should ignore or stay away from but the acknowledgement of wrongdoing and the sorrow that comes from that and the desire to amend one's ways to repent to confess sins and to change is what the example we saw in Acts and is also the example we see in the Corinthians here and the same message is coming to us here in these first seven chapters of the letter that all this all the physical suffering and persecution that Paul has undergone for the Corinthians and for everything for the gospel was nothing compared to uh, the joy that he has in Christ so that's the first seven chapters concluded so next month Lord willing we'll pick up with the next uh, section of the book which is chapters 8 and 9 which is to do with uh, the giving thank you